Okay, hi everyone. This is going to be the video for chapter five. We're looking at uh, communicating and interpreting accounting information. This video will be uh, maybe marginally shorter than the other PowerPoint videos. The reason being is there will be a separate documentary for you to watch. And in short, right, there's not that much new in this chapter. I think they designed the textbook in such a way to really push you for the first four chapters and then uh, thereafter give you a little bit of a break before they ramp it up even more. So take this chapter as, uh, yes, we're building off of everything we've learned, but after this, uh, it will get more difficult. So things we're going to be learning about in this chapter are players in the accounting communication process. The disclosure process, look a little bit further at uh, financial statements in the notes, and then ROA analysis, return on asset analysis. So one big thing in accounting, right, is this idea of corporate governance. It's the procedure designed to ensure that the company is managed in the interest of the shareholders. For example, right, we have Enron in the early 2000s. There was a lack of of corporate governance there, right? There was mismanagement at the top, created a lot of problems for a lot of people. So after Enron and other uh, events in the early 2000s, the accounting community said, hey, we really need to focus on corporate governance, right? And regulators in this capacity who will look at it, like who can come in and help shape and create rules in that sense, we have the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, so that's an actual government agency, right? Uh, they determine the rules and regulations that if you want to be you know, publicly listed on a public stock exchange, you have to follow these rules. Also, we have the FASB, right? The private sector body that makes out the rules of GAAP. They can come in and you know, give some comments on corporate governance. And then... Finally, we have the PCAOB, sometimes called the Peekaboo, right? So this is a separate body, a private sector body, and they deal a lot with uh, creating auditing standards, right? So if you're a public, uh, you know, work in public accounting and you're an auditor and you're looking at big publicly traded companies, when you conduct an audit, right, you review those financial statements to make sure they're fairly presented, you would have to do that following uh, PCAOB procedures, right? Auditing standards. So when we're talking about like the business itself, right? A large publicly traded company, uh, you have the officers, right? And they're uh, like what they're doing is they're running the business day to day, like overseeing it from the top. And the largest, like most important officer is the CEO, right? The chief executive officer highest officer in the company. Generally, uh, after that, you have you know a couple other, it's kind of like president, vice president, right? But if you're talking about financial and accounting, uh, who is the most important there other than the CEO? It would be the CFO, the chief financial officer. Now, the idea with these two, the CEO and the CFO, is they have to personally certify each report filed with the SEC, right? Uh, post Enron, one of the things they said is, hey, you guys, the, the tone at the top, the highest people, you are signing off on these uh, you know, financial statements and other uh, SEC disclosures personally. So if you're you know, making a false disclosure here and we can prove this, uh, you're, you're going to be personally liable. You could go to jail, we could take your house, so on and so forth. Before this, right, before they had these like more draconian provisions, what happened, for example, in Enron, everybody was pointing the finger at everybody else, right? Like, no, I don't know what's going on. You know, look at that guy. You go to the other guy. Well, I, I don't know what's going on. Look at that guy. Everybody, you know, as it were, was burying their head in the sand. So they kind of made this rule post Enron that says, hey, look, regardless of what you know or actually know, uh, you know, we're going to hold you responsible. So, you know, there's no burying your head in the sand moving forward. You sign off on this and there's a, you know, a false item on here. 
uh, you know, you will be liable for that personally. Now, other individuals in the business who help with the financial statement process, this would include like accounting staff, right? So if you work in like private industry, you're an accountant for Amazon, right? And you help Amazon prepare their financial statements, you would be part of their accounting staff. Likewise, other people that are important, right, is you have the board of directors. So basically, you have officers and directors. Uh, officers oversee the business on a day-to-day -day basis, where the directors, uh, they're really managing the corporation, right? They're at like a high level above it. And as I have here, right, the board of directors, as I have, they manage the corporation, they elect officers, they adopt bylaws, declare dividends, initiate fundamental changes. In short, right, how it works is uh, shareholders of these publicly traded companies, they will vote in uh, or elect the board members. And really, when you're talking about board members, it's kind of like, you know, the Knights of a Round Table. Imagine you have like a big oval table and everybody's sitting around it, right? Maybe there's 15 board members. Each will have a different a different specialty, right? So uh, maybe one's really good at financials, one's really good at operations. You got a tech guy, you got somebody who you know is an expert in the nature of our business. Everybody brings something different to the table, and what they do is they kind of look at those like 15 people at the table and they say, "Hey, we need to break this up into committees, right? You need to serve on committees." Uh, and there will be different committees for different things, right? So there will be like an audit committee, uh, a compensation committee, different things that deal with like the operations of the business and, uh, you know, other items associated with managing the business. So one committee, right, is called the audit committee. And if you were a board member, you might serve on this. And really what the audit committee does is, uh, they hire the external third-party auditor, right? So imagine we're Amazon. Uh, we have our board of directors, 15 people there. Maybe five of them serve on the audit committee. Their goal is, uh, among other things, we need to pick who is going to be the auditor of Amazon, right? Maybe we pick Deloitte, we pick PwC, uh, so on and so forth. And one of the things uh, with these board members who are on the audit committee, they have to be, as it were, independent directors. In other words, they can't be really hired or work for the company itself, right? So, for example, if you had, um, you know, an employee or an officer, the CEO, so like sometimes the CEO can be, you know, the CEO and they can be a board member. However, they wouldn't be an independent director on the board because they actually work for the company. <clears throat> so, for example, with the Amazon one, maybe you have uh, you know, a retired individual from Facebook who is really high ranking and very knowledgeable. He has no connection to Amazon, uh, but for the fact that you know, he's good at online uh, items, he's respected in the field. Amazon likes him because uh, they could use his expertise. They make him a board member. He, because he's not an employee of Amazon, he's not an officer, he's not paid for any like services to Amazon, would be considered an independent director. So you can see that kind of like independence uh, idea there. And if you're picking the auditor, right, it makes sense that you want people who are independent. The whole idea of auditing and looking at a company's financial statements uh, is to be objective and independent, right? We don't want any bias when we look at these. We don't want any, uh, you know, subjectivity or, uh, you know, unfavorableness or unfairness, right? We need to look at this objectively, independent, uh, independently, and fairly, right? So that's the idea with the board members. Uh, they serve on different committees. One committee is the audit committee. To be on that, you have to be an independent director. So we talked a little bit about auditors. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about them. So the SEC requires publicly traded companies. So if you're like on a stock exchange, your people are buying and selling your stock, you have to have audited financial statements. 
from an independent auditor, right? And what happens is essentially you would hire a public accounting firm and normally these like large publicly traded companies, they go to, you know, one of these big four accounting firms, Deloitte, KPMG, Ernst & Young, uh, and PwC, PricewaterhouseCooper. There's like four very large uh, accounting firms that control most of the very large businesses. You can be an auditor for like a medium-sized public accounting firm, but you would more likely have medium-sized clients. So, for example, when I was in practice, right, I was at uh, a firm called Schneider Downs in Pittsburgh. Uh, one of our clients was Sheets, right? So that's like not a giant company in the sense that like, you know, you're seeing it on the news every night. Yeah, people know what Sheets is, but it's more like a medium sized business. Whereas something that like Amazon would be like a very large business, uh, so kind of the nature of the firm you work at, a small, medium, or large uh, public accounting firm would dictate the nature of the clients you have, small, medium, or large size clients. In any event, right, when we have auditors, they have to basically come in, they're external uh, reviewers, right? It's kind of like in football, right? If you have football and somebody, you're watching the NFL and somebody takes a hit, and, uh, you know, they may have had a concussion, right? They bring in that independent doctor who comes in and examines them and is like supposed to be independent. But, you know, who knows if they actually are. And the idea is you need someone to come in, look at it and you know, judge the situation. In the same way with auditors, right, we need someone to come in who's independent, look at these financial statements the company is producing and say, are they fairly presented? And kind of the culmination of an auditor's work is this thing called an audit report, right? It's basically, you know, it's like imagine you have a book report you have to do, right? Like once upon a time, maybe in high school or middle school, you had to read a book and do a book report. It's the same with auditors, right? They have to examine the financial statements and then produce an audit report. And in that report, they basically explain what they did. Hey, you know, we looked at. Uh, the financial statements of this company, you know, we did A, B, C, we tested X, Y, and Z. And we think it is our opinion, that is to say we give an audit opinion, uh, that these financial statements are clean, right? They uh, are presented fairly. So uh, there's various types of audit opinions, right? There can be like a clean opinion, a modified opinion, not as concerned about the nuances of that as I am that you just know what the role of an auditor is. And if you go into accounting, you want to learn accounting, one of the decisions you have to make if you go into public accounting, it's kind of like a fork in the road. You either traditionally go into like tax or auditing. There's also like a consulting side to it as well. But if you were to study accounting and, uh, you know, go to like a college career fair for accounting. Nine tenths of the companies that come are publicly traded companies. And when you get that interview with them, they will say to you, do you want to do audit or do you want to do tax? There's not necessarily a right answer to that because, you know, you don't know what you know until you actually have some experience. So in, in those kind of situations, it's best just to say something like, uh, well, both are interesting. Uh, I, I think I'd exceed it both. If you want to do audit, right, or tax, if you have a like, proclivity towards one, then yeah, I'd say express your interest toward it. But uh, if you're just looking like to get in with that firm, your foot in the door, uh, the more open you are, the more flexible you are, uh, the better you know, the chances are. So some other ideas here when we're looking at uh, big publicly traded companies and filing of their documents. Uh, one of the things is uh, they have to file any SEC reports, right, like their 10K, their 10Q, through this Edgar system. So essentially we have the publicly traded company, for example, Amazon. We have the shareholders, right, and the investors, the ones who are looking at the company. Uh, and we have uh, the auditors who audit the financial statements. And then we have the SEC who makes the rules for this like whole process. And their goal is to try to protect those shareholders and, and investors. 
And what the SEC says is, hey, we have a bunch of different reports and items and forms that you, Amazon, need to fill out. And when you fill them out, you know, you don't just like do them by hand. You have to use our online system, this Edgar system, to complete and upload them in there. And oh, by the way, when you use Edgar, our system, any uh, report that you submit, uh, it has to be in XBRL format. And what XBRL is, it basically is a type of like coding where um, any item on the financial statement can be analyzed and run through different like reports and scans and mechanisms from uh, the SEC. So it's basically, it's not just like, you know, complete a form and then submit a PDF of it to the SEC, like email it to them. No, you have to submit it through Edgar, uh, you know, their online system. And when you do that, any report you submit has to be coded appropriately on like a back end way so that when you submit it to them, they can analyze it. Uh, and they look at things for like accuracy, completeness, different ratios. They're really just looking to make sure uh, that everything is fair uh, and makes sense uh, and is appropriate and ethical. Then from the outside of these businesses, right, you have financial analysts. Uh, so these are people who work like independently of Amazon or whatever the publicly traded company is. They're basically you know, looking at the companies, those, uh, the reports, and they're saying, uh, should we invest in this company? Is it going to be profitable? Uh, what are our projections, our forecasts for the future? Should you buy this security? Should you sell it? Or should you hold it? And people, you know, when you think of shareholders, a lot of times you think of like, hey, I'm going to open a Robinhood account, right? Maybe buy some GameStop stock. That's really only like a very small percentage of people who are actually buying the stock. Most of the stock market, uh, you know, the owners of the stock of these businesses, it's like institutional investors. So like big pensions, right? If uh, So for example, if you work for a local government or a state government or the federal government, you may get uh, a pension after working there X amount of years, right? And the idea is, and it all depends on the nature of your company, what the terms and conditions are, but you put away some money, the company matches it. And then when you retire, you get a fixed like annuity every month, you know, 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks, whatever the case is, until you die. This is in distinction to something called like a 401k or a 403b. But the idea with all of these, just to give you like a heads up, most of the owners of the stock market are people's retirement accounts. Whether you have a pension, uh, like, you know, it's called a defined benefit plan, or you have a 401k or a 403b, which is kind of, which is called a defined contribution plan. That's going to be a big chunk of it. Right. You also have people who are just buying and sell, selling stock themselves with kind of like excess the money, money they have. And then, uh, you know, institutions, banks, businesses, uh, they would also be looking at the uh, financial statements of companies. So we're going to look at here some of the disclosures required by the SEC. Right, so the SEC sets the rules uh, for companies that want to be publicly traded. And the first one here is this SEC regulation FD, fair disclosure. And what this is really saying is, hey, you, you know, a publicly traded company, you need to provide your investors equal access to all uh, like any kind of important company news. Right. In other words, managers and other insiders, you can't be trading stuff on insider information. Uh, it's called you know, material non-public information. We don't want that. Right. Everything needs to be equally accessed, fair to everybody. And in this way, right, if you're sharing information as a business to the public, there's certain things you can do. Right. You can have a press release where it's like written public news announcement. Hey, our earnings this quarter were, you know, 3% or 4% or, you know, you could put it in a percentage or an amount. Uh, you could have public conferences 
right, where people come in and ask questions about the results. The idea with all of this, if, again, if we're just trying to look at it from the big picture level, what is the goal of the SEC? It's to protect investors, right? We don't want put people, you know, using all their retirement accounts, their, you know, pensions and 403Bs and 401Ks to invest in some company. And then it just goes like kaput, right? It's gone. And then there goes all their retirement. We need to make sure that uh, when a person invests their money, the information they're seeing from the company, from those financial statements is accurate and fair. So in that way, right, we require the SEC public companies to, you know, periodically release some reports. And the big one here is the 10K, right? So this is annual, the 10K. What you need to include in this report uh, are disclosures about the business, uh, you know, the strategy. The big thing is here is financial data for the fast, uh, past five years, financial statements and supplemental data. The big guy is the 10K. Annually, once a year, you need to do a big report about the financial position of your company, where, you've at, where you're at, you know, where you've been, what is your company. Likewise, quarterly. Right. You have to release and do a 10Q. Right. Makes sense. 10Q quarterly for Q. This is like kind of a simpler version of the 10K. These are the two big ones. Right. Like once a year, you have to publicly disclose and release audited financial statements. So that's a big one as part of your 10K. Quarterly, we want to see something as well, like a shrink down version of the 10K. And then outside of that, like kind of every quarter and once a year, if something happens like very important in between those deadlines, you need to uh, complete this form 8K, right? And this is basically any material event not previously reported to investors. So it's like, yeah, we got the big guy once a year and then every you know, three months, we can see where you're at. But if you change the CEO or you have a major, your company's going to merge, we can't wait till the next 10Q for you to disclose that. You need to file that Form 8K, you know, reasonably soon. So next here, we're going to look a little bit closer at the financial statements. And the idea with these is, right, we're going to look at, uh, you know, other items on the balance sheet. So, uh, first off, it says up here, public companies often provide comparative financial statements. This just says they'll be like year one, year two on the same financial statements. It'll show like what your balance sheet was last year versus what your balances are this year. It's comparative because you can compare, right? You can look and see where you were last year to where you are now. And if you're looking at a balance sheet, right, one of the new items here that we're going to talk about are intangibles. An intangible is something that does not have a physical existence, right? So in other words, how you would you know, bifurcate this is you have tangible assets and intangible. Tangible means that you can touch, see, taste, feel, you know, hear them, right? They're tangible. They're like in real life, right? So like your computer in front of you, that's a tangible object, a building, machinery. It's all things you can see. Intangibles mean more like of the mind, right? So it's things like pat, copyright, uh, things of that nature. And the idea here is in the same way, right, that we buy uh, a building, we don't take the expense and you know, we tee up the building and then we periodically recover the cost of that building through depreciation, uh, so like right by at $100 debit depreciation expense every 10 years for 10 bucks. We have a similar concept of cost recovery for intangibles. In other words, when you buy or create an intangible, uh, you generally aren't going to immediately take the expense. Then instead, you're going to amortize the intangible. So every year take you know, debit amortization expense, debit amortization expense. It's the same concept, right, of fixed asset and depreciation, intangible asset amortization, just a different name for that cost recovery mechanism. 
And generally with intangibles, right, you're going to uh, amortize them. Goodwill, however, which we'll talk about, you know, in a separate area, is uh, more of a general intangible, and that's going to be reported separately. So we'll talk about goodwill, what you do there, whether you uh, were to amortize it, or instead what we'll, what we'll see you know, tested for something called impairment. But for right now, the main thing I just want you to focus on, intangibles, you amortize them generally. There are some exceptions to that. We talked about deferred revenues, right? So this is uh, the idea where you get the money before you earn it. These can be put, placed as a current or non-current liability. It all depends on the facts and circumstances. Do you think you're going to earn it generally within the next year? If yes, current liability. If not, uh, non-current liability. So this is just showing a comparative balance sheet, right? We have like year one, year two. Uh, here's our cash, right? Our balances. Looks like we have some intangibles on there, right? Our goodwill, our uh, intangible assets. When it says net there for these guys, that means net of accumulated amortization. Uh, we have our liabilities on here and then our stockholders equity. The next idea, we're going to uh, break out the multi-step income statement a little bit further. And basically the idea here is another way you can categorize an income statement would be a classified income statement. And all you're really doing here is uh, you're breaking out your operating expenses, right? So that's why I have a little arrow here. Like once you get down to here, it's basically the same. This top part up here, you're just more specifically breaking out, right? So your operating revenues are going to be uh, your net sales. Then you're going to take your cost of goods sold and expense. Uh, we'll talk about this in the inventory chapter, but for right now, if you just want to keep this straight in your mind, Cost of goods sold is an expense. What does it represent? It's the cost of the goods we sold. In other words, when we sell our inventory, what did it cost us to make or produce that inventory? We will learn generally with inventory, you don't, whenever you uh, buy it, expense it. Instead, you capitalize it, put it on the balance sheet. And then when you sell it, you take the expense for it as cost of goods sold. But for the time being, right, the idea here is you have your net sales minus your cost of goods sold. This gets you your gross profit. From there, it's the same as the multi-step income statement, but we're just more specifically breaking it out up here. Now, this gross profit, sometimes it's also called the gross margin, right? Remember when we looked at the chapter, you know, maybe a chapter or two ago? where we looked at the ratio with margins. Anytime you're dealing with margins, you're really looking at like profitability, right? So with this, right, your gross margin, you're really looking at what did it cost you, right? Your cost of goods sold and what did you sell it for? That's what we're like looking at here in a very simple way. Okay, you walk on Shark Tank, right? You go in, you have Sponge Daddy. One of the very first questions they'll ask, uh, and I think they're like, I think they like pose some of these questions to them beforehand, right? Like if you're a shark on Shark Tank, and especially like now they have this like Shark Tank Live, you don't want to look stupid asking like a question, right? Because you're supposed to be the expert shark. A very, very safe question to ask, and you will see this, what do you sell it for and what does it cost you to make? Uh, and really what they're getting at is this guy right here, right? We, we do care about all of these like peripheral items here, but the big things they focus on are these two items. And then did you actually make money, right? What was your net income or net loss? Remember I said sales can be deceptive. I don't care if you have $10 million of sales. If you, however, uh, are uh, at a loss, that's not a good thing. Now, there are some explanations for that. So like businesses in the early years of operations can be at a loss because they're building up like customers and revenue. 
But consistently net loss businesses, that's not like a business, right? The businesses are supposed to be profitable. And when I'm honing in on this gross profit right here, your sales minus your cost of goods sold, what do you sell it for versus what does it cost you? I'm really looking at just the product itself, right? Uh, you know, how in demand is your product and how efficient are you at making that product? What does it cost you to make it? Now, here's a uh, you know consolidated statement of operations. Again, just a fancier name for an income statement, right? You have your sales minus your cost of sales or cost of goods sold. That gets you your gross profit, right? From there, it's pretty much the same breakout as before. Now, one of the things I'm just going to plant the seed for, uh, you don't need to worry about this for the exam. But if you are to study accounting later on, they do have like a separate statement called the statement of comprehensive income. It's like a more elaborate income statement. And the idea here is with your statement of comprehensive income, you take your net income from the income statement, plus you add other comprehensive income items to it. It's basically like a broader way of looking at your revenues and expenses. So, for example, something that might be on a statement of other comprehensive income that isn't on an income statement would be unrealized gains or losses on securities. What does that mean? Let's say you bought Apple stock for 100 bucks. Here we are at the end of the year and it's worth 900. Under generally most accounting rules, you're not going to have uh, or include that in that income because you actually haven't sold the stock yet, right? You only have the gain once you sell it. However, right, a more comprehensive view of your income, somebody would say is, yeah, you know, that unrealized, you didn't cash it in yet. That's what unrealized and unrealized means. Like, did you turn this into cash or not? Did you sell it? Uh, that unrealized, just the holding gain you've had on it, we want to include that in income. But that's only on this statement of other comprehensive income. So I don't want to belabor this. Just be aware if you do study you know, other accounting courses, you'll kind of see like a fifth financial statement, the statement of other comprehensive income. And it's exactly what the statement means. It's a more comprehensive or, or uh, broader view of your income. And this is like just an example of it. Look a little bit here at uh, the statement of stockholders' equity, right? We said generally it's going to uh, you know, include common stock, retained earnings. That common stock is going to be broken out between those two portions. You have your retained earnings there. One of the items this accumulated other comprehensive income from that statement of comprehensive income will go on there. Again, that's like for a more advanced accounting class. Uh, I'm just letting you know that there is this item. It's like an additional fifth statement, statement of comprehensive income, and it can roll over and touch and concern other financial statements, just like how all of them are connected. Right, so here's an idea of a statement of stockholders' equity with that you know, comprehensive income, the AOCI. It's like a retained earnings account uh, in there. Next idea, right, with the financial statements is the statement of cash flows. So for this, right, we have generally the idea with the statement of cash flows, you have your beginning cash and your ending cash, right? So it's like you started with 100 bucks in your bank account. Now at the end of the month, you have 1000 bucks, right? How did you get there? Well, we had a bank deposit. We had a bank deposit. Cash inflow plus, plus. We spent some money right? Cash outflow, minus, minus. And the idea with that is you have your beginning, it went up some, it went down, it went up. All depends on what your income and your expenses are, you know, in the bank account, cash in, cash out. And every time you have one of those inflows or outflows, you need to categorize it as an operating, investing, or financing. Activity. So does it relate to the operations of the business, right? Did we sell goods for cash? 
operating inflow? Uh, is it an investing activity? Did we sell uh, or buy an investment, right, in that case? Uh, and then financing. Did we issue stock, right? How do we look at long-term uh, debt holders? Now, one of the things is when you're looking at the operating section of the statement of cash flows, there's two ways you can prepare this, right? Uh, you have the direct method and the indirect method. And the direct method is going to show cash inflows and outflows uh, to arrive at cash flows from operating activities, whereas uh, the indirect method is going to start with your net income, make adjustments for non-cash items, and get you to your cash flow from operating activities. Here's the layout of it, right? The direct method is really just like every time you have an inflow or outflow, right? Uh, inflow, outflow, 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 outflow. There we go, right? It gets you to 110. The indirect method, right, is indirect. In other words, this is very explicit over here. It's very direct. It literally shows you every time you have an inflow and outflow. Instead, what you can do right, is you can start with your net income, right, and if you're looking at your operating activities, that would make sense, right, you could start there, and then you could kind of back out some non-cash items, make some adjustments for non-cash items, that will get you to that same 110 amount. So again, for this chapter, we're not doing the deep dive on this, we're just breaking it out a little bit further to expose you to these items as we go forward in future chapters. So this one is a statement of cash flows. It looks like here, right, we have the operating, the investing, and financing activities. Uh, we have our beginning cash, our ending cash down here, the things that happen in between. The investing and the financing activities, uh, these are fixed, right, and how you prepare them. But the operating section up here, there's two ways you can prepare that section. Here it looks like they're using the indirect method, right? They're starting with net income and then they're making adjustments to it. Finally here, we're gonna talk a little bit about a note, like some of the notes and then the financial statements uh, and maybe a ratio. So when we're talking about notes to the financial statements, we're really saying, uh, hey, what are the important things that we want to know about the company that aren't obvious based on the four corners of this document? In other words, what additional information should be disclosed in the footnotes? In the biggest footnote, right, the most important footnote is this thing called the Summary of Significant Accounting Policies. So any publicly traded company that you look at is going to have one of these. And the idea with it is it's basically a summary, it's a footnote of the significant accounting policies. What methods do we use for depreciation? How did we calculate that? What other accounting pol policies did we apply, right? So that's the big guy, right? There's different notes in the back, but the one note that's like critically important is the summary of your accounting policies. It's a name for it. You could have additional notes, right, like showing how you got this calculation or breaking out, uh, you know, your sales by you know, different regions or business type. Basically, anything that's important that somebody should know about, if it's not in the financial statements itself, you need to put it in the notes. The most important note or the most common note is the summary of significant accounting policies. Finally, here we have a couple different ratios, right? Uh, first one here is the gross profit percentage, right? So this is a big one. It's really looking at how effective management is in selling its goods and services for more than cost to produce those goods, right? And a lot of what we're getting at here are uh, how profitable are you, right? So you're going to take your gross profit over your net sales, where your gross profit equals your net sales minus your cost of goods sold. Right? We saw that when we looked at the broken out uh, income statement. And then your net sales, which we'll see in the you know, forthcoming chapters, is your sales 
minus any allowance for returns or discounts. The idea with that is uh, if you take your gross profit divided by your net sales, that gives you like your percentage of profitability, your gross profit percentage. Another ratio here that's important is this return on assets, right? And this is really looking at uh, for all of your assets, right? How do you use your assets to help you generate uh, income, right? And the idea with this is the higher the ratio, uh, the more effective the firm is at selecting and managing the investment. And what you do here is, right, you have your net income over your average total assets. Again, be aware, right, if it says average, right, there's that little asterisk there. That's your beginning of the year plus your ending divided by two. Okay. So with that, right, this chapter, like I said, it's a little bit just breaking out what we've already learned. Uh, there will be an associated you know, a documentary we'll watch. So with that, I'm going to end the lecture here at about you know, 40, 45 minutes. And we will see you in the problems video. So thank you, and we'll see you in the next video.